Hey guys, Leanna here. It's Mount Monday. So you know what to do. Breathe in and breathe out. And breathe in and breathe out. Okay, so this is the Mountain Monday after the whole airplay weekend and Zen is needed. Zen is needed because of, you know, the evacuation, the bomb threat. And, oh, jeez, I don't, I don't want to dwell on that. I don't want to dwell on the drama because that's not Zen, right? And people are asking, what, what's going on with Momo Mondays? When is there going to be a next Momo Monday? I will still eventually do a Momo Monday, but Momo has to cooperate. I, he, sometimes he's in the mood to have a camera shoved in his face and he'll talk and be cute. Other times, like, leave me alone. And he's been a pr in a prolonged leave me alone phase so momo will return just not this week what i want to talk about this week on mountain monday is the the request that people have made about you know moving forward with um with things after um oh what did i do there okay there we go after the whole airplay thing people feel like there's um uh fresh tolerance for discussion and closure and healing and all that stuff. Um, where, where I think we move forward from is, and getting back to the fundamentals of the things that make us similar are more common or more prevalent than the things that make us different. There has been an obsession with difference in, in gaming over the last year and beyond, but this year it's been, you know, particularly heightened, you know, what color you are, what sexual orientation you are, what gender you are, what gender identity you are, um, you know, and religion and background and socioeconomic bracket and all this stuff. But to me that that distracts from are you a gamer do you do you play games sometimes or do you love games are you passionate about video games it's the difference between someone who drives a toyota camry and someone who drives you know a corvette or an aston martin or a lamborghini or you know one of those ford supercars that is the difference and that I think is important because, you know, for people who just want to play games, they don't want to have discussions about the guts of games and the makeup of games and, you know, um, whether, whether a floating camera in first person is a truly immersive experience, does an FPS um, protagonist need a body, things like this, the average person doesn't care. That's a game enthusiast conversation, right? Those are the conversations I want to have. Those are, are my people. That's what I'm interested in exploring in gaming. I really want to dig deep. I really want to create useful tools to get away from this flat analysis, as I call it, the flat analysis of gaming that has come out of analyzing them using tools, cultural tools for the real world via sociology or film or still image analysis that was never designed to be used for interactive media, okay? I don't think we can really have discussions about the sociopolitical elements of gaming and really have useful outcomes until we have tools that actually measure the thing we are measuring. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Um, and I mean, I've, I've been starting little things, you know, I, I wrote that piece and I, I had to deal with it basically on, you know, my issues with Anita Sarkeesian's followers, but I talked about the challenge of agency and player, uh, you know, player agency and, and character agency and all that stuff and how they blend in games. Um, you know, I've, I've tried to talk about gender performativity instead of gaze theory things like that. I've started trying to lay the groundwork with gender, but I, I don't think the most useful tool is going to be something that only applies to race or only applies to gender. We need sort of, you know, 
the the equivalent in physics to a, a, a unified a unified theory, right? Uh, we need tools that measure from an intersectional approach. We need stuff that can look at, and obviously you focus on individual components using these tools, but they can't be tools that can only be used to analyze various things. And that, that doesn't mean that, oh, here's this thing we do talking about gender, that's no good. No, I mean that the actual, the actual instruments, the actual terminologies we're using have to actually be about games. You know, we can't talk about cultivation theory studies on television and apply them to games because games aren't TV. We can't take gaze theory and apply them to games because that's, you know, assuming that that's assuming maleness and leaving out, um, you know, the gay and lesbian experience. We can't even assume gender because we're dealing with play and we're dealing with performance and there's, the, the, there's really comp, there's serious complications and serious abstracts when it comes to, okay, it may be a guy who's biologically male playing the game, but if he's playing that game as a woman, is he a man? Is he a woman? Is he both? So we need, you know, we need those, we need those tools for gaming that deal with that unique experience. And that doesn't happen in film, right? You're not one sort of viewer watching a movie and then one sort of viewer in a movie actively participating. That, that's not the way it works. That, that, that's not the way it works with linear media at all, right? Um, and games are so unique in that way. And that's super important to me. I mean, the game that I think a lot of people are, are going to resonate with of a certain age is American McGee's Alice. I mean, the number of dudes that ran around that game as Alice and and the thing that's beautiful about that game is even though it's it's third person and people are like I, I don't care what happens to third person protagonist um there was something gloriously immersive about that game um in that it was you know it, it's Alice in Wonderland it, it inherently you are being transported to another world you're going down the rabbit hole but it was Alice as we hadn't seen it before right it was one of those uh, transformative works that now when Disney makes a, uh, an Alice in Wonderland movie, they take elements of American McGee's Alice and, you know, it, 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 it cycles all back. It's this, it's this meta production. It's this meta story or, or meta art direction. You know, you, you get that little bit of the Gothic, you get, um, elements of American McGee's Alice in the design of the Mad Hatter. Right. I mean, it might not have been deliberate, but it's definitely part of the zeitgeist. And, and that game, um, I've seen people pick that game apart. And at the end, what that game had is just this ability to embed you in it, you know, and accept the reality of that game and accept what you couldn't do or not do. You accepted the rules of that realm. Right. And you got so into it that you didn't question it anymore. And then you can come out and go, Hey, yeah, why did that weapon work that way? Or why did the plot go that way? But when you're in it, you're not thinking that you're experiencing it. And that's so important. But did a male player experience that as a guy or did he experience it as Alice? And does that matter? Well, to some people, it matters very much to me. I kind of look at it and go, you know, I'm going to play God of War. I'm experiencing that game through Kratos. And I accept that. I, I am a participant in Kratos' story. I always see God of War as sort of you are an additional god controlling Kratos through the story. So he has his own opinions about things. And he has his own emotions about things. But you are controlling his movements, which I, I thought was this beautiful element of game design. Um, because the narrative and the type of gameplay they use fit so nicely together. You know, when I played Dishonored, I wasn't making the choices. And this is just how I play games. I wasn't making the choices as me. I'm like, okay, I'm Corvo. And I'm this, 
you know, protector to the empress who's died. And there's this girl, there's Emily and I have an attachment to her. And that sort of drove some of my choices, but that led to some, you know, deliberate trickery on the part of the game is when you get in there, what's that character? The, the granny character. And then, you know, the, the dark, um, the, the, the dark guy. And I forget all the names cause it's been a while, but what I remember distinctly about dishonored is it challenged the preconceptions you made in character that, okay, I'm loyal to this woman. I'm, lo I'm loyal to the Empress. I'm loyal to Emily. I felt inclined therefore to be loyal to the other wo women in the game. And then of course that's an assumption because not all the women are good. Uh, and you know, siding with, with granny is actually a high chaos decision. Uh, and, and you, you gotta watch out for that. And I thought that was a great element of, of game design. It was, you know, some would even call it a, a feminist element that, oh, you're not painting all women with the same brush. You're, you're dealing with your female cast as individuals who are capable of good and capable of evil and, you know, capable of honesty and capable of lies. Uh, I thought that was a great element of the game. Uh, but that's, that's exploring the game from the inside. It's not looking at the game and go, oh, the Empress dies horribly, which other people do. And, you know, the big question is, is that a valid form of analysis? That content is a cutscene in the game where the Empress dies. Is it valid to study that scene in isolation? And that's where you get into disciplines. If you're doing a close read in English literature, it's absolutely valid. It's acceptable to scene study that scene and take it in isolation. I hated that element of the English literature approach. I'm like, how can I pull a single scene out of the book and rob it of context? But in English literature, I always got context as a humanities approach. Her, 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 her. Looking down at, at humanity is a sub sub discipline. And then you go to humanities and, you know, wanting to focus on a detail. Well, well that's a, that's a literature. That's a close read approach. We don't do that here. And I'm like, holy freaking, I'm in Wonderland now. I think that's why I like Wonderland so much. Cause like, I just went from a course in the morning to a course in the afternoon. It's the same damn books. And you're telling me, you know, the, the rules changed while I was eating shitty cafeteria food. Seriously, all of a sudden that scene means something completely different because of the name on the course. That is the sort of, I'll call it indoctrination. You know, let's go full blown mass effect. That is the indoctrination that happens in the, in universities nowadays, because everybody's got their turfs and everybody's got their territories and it is anathema to critical thinking. This idea that no, your decisions change because all of a sudden you put on a different, a different hue of rose colored glasses. That's insane. That's exact. That's the, exactly the nonsense makes sense that Lewis Carroll was talking about in Alice in Wonderland. Interestingly enough, that came from his career in academia and Victorian society. That's what he was goofing on. You know, who cares what fork you use at a dinner? Well, it shows breeding, right? And that, that's the thing is that the analysis we're getting of gaming right now is not, is it useful? I don't know because I, I don't necessarily find that a person playing Dishonored like a player is going to all of a sudden go, oh God, the Empress has killed. This game is violent against women. Cause to me, it's like, oh shit. You know, Corvo, I fail. Like I, as Corvo, just failed to protect the person I'm supposed to protect. Crap. You know? And she happened to be female. She also happened to be a leader. So to me, it's a regicide trope. It's not that women in refrigerators thing, which is a completely valid concept that's been overused to the point that it's no longer... Um, I know Gail Simone was even saying on Twitter the other week that it's, it's not being intended the way she intended it to be used. Um, and when the person who sort of coined the term is going, Hey, time out, it's time to take a step back. But again, that's because, you know, tools, right tool for the right job. Can you cut a steak with a hacksaw? Sure. Is it the best tool to use? No, a steak knife is right. And when you don't use the right tool, you, you, 
you get something that's hacked apart, sure, you'll you'll cut up that piece of meat, but it's like a steak knife is a steak knife for a reason. The hacksaw, you're, you're going to damage your plate, you might nick your table, and it's a lot more work, and it's kind of dirty because there's oil on it. Like, you know, you're, you're getting all these other variables that, that aren't necessary. And th this is why I think we can't, I mean, it's going to continue to move forward because things have to move forward. But all these arguments about feminism and intersectionality and racism and homophobia and transphobia and everything like that, I think we need to call a moratorium among those of us who want productive discussion because we have to leave the lunatic fringe behind. There's, there's nothing for it, right? It, the lunatic fringe is going to lunatic. Um, but we have to sort of agree we can't have these discussions meaningfully until we actually know what we're discussing, right? We're all talking about the same thing. In and we're back. Sorry about that, guys. Technical difficulties. Um, but, you know, we, we need to... We need to be able to define terms for the purposes of discussion. You know, case in point, we talk about feminism. And I get the, feminism hates men. Feminism is kill all men. Well, well no, it's not. Prove it. Feminism is about seeking equality for men and women. No, it's not. It has feminism right in the name. That, that's sophistry the accepted definition of feminism is equality between men and women. That, that is the only central thing that all feminists have in common. Now, different ways of doing that are different things. Why is it called feminism and not, you know, equalism or egalitarianism or whatever? Because it comes from a time when women were far less empowered in society than we are today. And it comes with an understanding that there is still more work to do. And it comes from a, you know, the fact that, like I said off the top, when it comes to gender as well as anything else, people like to focus on the differences as opposed to the sameness and one of the core elements of feminism that I was brought up in, that I, you know, talk about is yes, men and women have different things about them. Yes, but the things that make us similar far outweigh the things that make us different. And therefore I'm tired of being treated like I'm weird because I like violent video games and I'm a woman. There should be nothing about being a woman that precludes me from liking violent video games because I am a person and individualism trumps any societal grouping, hurting we may want to do. But that's the thing, right? Is for so long, gender and race and sexuality and all this stuff, instead of being seen as spectrums, instead of being seen as these complex things people want to slap them into binaries. You're male or you're female. You're gay or you're straight. You're uh, black or you're white. And all these other races, well, you just sort of sit in the corner while we keep fighting out these black-white issues because America. Um, and this is all completely counterproductive, isn't it? Because, um, you know, there are women who adore pink and heavily identify with the whole pink and girly and bows in the hair. And that's fine. And then there's me who doesn't identify with that at all. I'm, I'm much more comfortable not in pink, um, in part because I'm a ginger kid and I don't, I don't need to look any, any more like a poisonous plant than I already do uh, or a poisonous insect. Um, but, you know, bright colors in nature mean danger. Uh, that's a joke, obviously. But I, I just, I have never identified with pink the same way other people do. And that is, that just is, right? It just is. And what does that mean? Nothing. It means nothing. It means I don't like pink as much as somebody else. 
And that's where we should leave it. But we can't. Why? Because we have all these dumb preconceptions about what gender is supposed to mean outside what washroom you use or, you know, what, what hormones your body produces. Sometimes, I mean, intersex people just throw that right into the, you know, gender is something we divide human beings in for expediency. And, and because in the vast majority of cases, it applies, but we shouldn't be so rigid about it that when somebody is not, is not gender conforming, we flip out and beat them up or are afraid of them or don't know what to deal with them or start slapping all these labels on them and laboring them aberrant. You know, being not normal doesn't mean you're dangerous. And normal just means the majority, right? It doesn't mean it's healthy. And, you know, meanwhile, we've, we've got guys who feel like they have to explain, you know, uh, American McGee's Atlas being awesome. American McGee was, American McGee is a guy, right? He listens to my stuff. I don't know if he'll listen to this, but he listens to my stuff. Hi, if you're listening, you're awesome. It's like, so what? Lewis Carroll was a guy. Of course, you know, some people want to say he's a pedophile. Because, of course, any man who's interested in the things little girls do. No, bullshit. That's a gender assumption. That's a gender assumption. So we still have work to do. And that's what feminism is to me. Like, yes, there are other schools of feminism, but kill all men may be something that's part of a radical wing that some feminists partake in. But there is nothing inherently feminist in the whole kill all men, which is supposed to be just like, you know, the kill all men is supposed to be interpreted kind of like rap lyrics. You know, we're saying it because we don't really intend to do it. Lyrical content. It's lyrical content. Which if you're a fan of hip hop, you understand. But clearly there are a lot of people who, who don't really understand the, the whole idea of, of um, catharsis and and saying something in a, in a really out there way because everybody's politically correct, right? Everybody's, everybody's squished right down. And everybody's like, you know, especially men, they, they know, you know, white men, they know they, they uh, can, you know, can't say certain things. Why? Because they're white men, right? And they're, they're supposed to be responsible for the, horrible acts committed by people who look like them four generations prior, right? Or three generations prior. And some places in the world much, much more recent. But a lot of people in North America were talking three or four generations back. And I mean, uh, uh, a buddy of mine linked to, linked me to a Russell Peters stand-up where he talks about how, you know, brown people have white people so convinced they're that they're racist that they won't even describe people based on the color of their skin because they don't want to be racist it's very funny and it's very true because i've seen it happen you know because it's i don't see color i don't see color bullshit people see color the question is how relevant is that color like what is the relevance of someone being asian or someone being brown or someone being black or someone being you know there's some some people who don't even like those descriptors you know, no, you're South Asian, you're not brown. And, and well, because I know some brown people who are from Guyana, which is, you know, why I don't necessarily use the term South Asian because I'm not going to force them outside of, you know, their geographic background. Um, but, you know, someone's skin color in especially Canada is so meaningless you know, in America, in some ways, it's even less meaningless. Like, it doesn't tell you what's in their heart. It, it may give you some insights into their cultural background. You know, um, like, you know, personally, I, I understand why people of some backgrounds more identify with conservative politics. And it's just because it more aligns with what the system they were brought up in. And that's not evil just because I don't share it, right? It's, it's where they are now. And let me tell you guys, for people that have come from those backgrounds, conservatism here, especially in Canada, is downright liberal compared to where they came from. So that's a big step. 
Like, that's a big step for people of some backgrounds, but that doesn't mean I'm going to assume how they feel about any other point. And, and this is the whole point, is that we need to be able to include people, and that means focusing on sameness. Focusing on difference is exclusionary. Oh, you're a woman, so you must abhor violent video games, for instance. And if not, you're a bad feminist. You're not an ally. Pardon my language. Fuck that. I'm quite capable of recognizing that it's not real. I, I would never do such things in real life. I mean, Part of the reason I enjoy that stuff is I used to do special effects makeup and we had to study gore. And guess what that meant? It meant actually looking at split open heads and puncture wounds and, you know, skin rips and, and bones jutting out and all these things, bruises. And you actually looked at, um, like morgue photos and, and police photos and things like that to see what it is. And it's nasty. I mean, the stuff that happens in, in most TV, um, yuck. And that's why I kind of like the video game violence because it's like, oh yeah, phew, you know, the blade comes out and blood flies everywhere and there's more blood in that one swipe than is in an entire human body. And I laugh because there's, there's an odd sort of, you know, surreal honesty to that. Um, it's not real violence. It's martial arts, right? And just like people can't jump the way they do in martial arts movies. It's, it's wires, it's wire effects. Right? That's fine. No one goes, oh, you can't tell the difference between reality and fantasy because you watch martial arts movies. People know it's wires. We're fine. People know wrestling's fake now. And even when we didn't know for sure wrestling was fake, we had a pretty good idea that you can't pick someone up over your head and force them to straighten their legs. You know? <laughs> that involves an element of cooperation. People aren't stupid. And... I, I think that this is this is where the dialogue is going to come from because even that statement, people aren't stupid, right? That is inherently more respect for the average person's intellect, the, the, the intellect of people who play games, than, than we're functioning on right now, right? Because we're not, oh, it's going to turn everybody violent, and oh my god, don't you dare give that game to a kid that's 17 because a magical switch flips in, in, in someone's brain when they turn 18, and all of a sudden they can handle mature-rated content. No, some people, I was one of them, can, you know, handle M-rated content at a younger age. Some people can't. And that's why it's glorious that the ESRB allows parents to choose. And that's why I get offended whenever I go into a game store and it's like, are you buying this for yourself? Yes. And guess what sort of game it usually is? It's some sort of, you know, violent game. I get questioned. My husband going in, who isn't playing the games, he's buying it for me. He doesn't get asked. If, if somebody asked him, are you buying this for yourself? He'd have to say no. But it's like, you're buying this for yourself? Yes. You're sure you're buying it for yourself? You're not buying it for a kid? Yes, I'm very sure. I've played the first two God of War games. This is God of War 3. Obviously, I'm relating an actual conversation that happened. Okay, because if you're buying it for a kid, I can't sell it to you. No, that's not what the ESRB says. It means they can't sell to a kid. If a parent wants to let their, their minor child play God of War. That is parental rights. We don't have to fucking like it. Okay? That's the whole point of it not being government mandated. Now I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about in other parts of the world. But this is how dumb the whole thing is. We, we fought and fought and fought and fought to get a voluntary industry supported review system that is so much better better and more informative than the stuff that movies are. We don't have a PG-13 rating. You know, our closest thing is, is the M for mature rating. That's this massive catch all. And that's not the same thing because it is like, Hey, if you're over 18, then you're an adult and we can't tell you what to buy. That makes more sense than this stupid, massive golf that is PG-13. You don't know what PG-13 means. So people with kids have to go to a movie that's probably going to bore them the first time because it's for children. And then go back, pay again 
with their kids. Like, this is work. What's the point of ratings? What's the point of ratings at all if people have to pre-screen everything? That's the entire purpose of ratings in the first place. But film ratings have failed so badly that parents can't trust them. Game reviews, on the other hand, you can look up and it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but parents can look up and see things that might be an issue. Oh, there's violence. Well, my kid can't handle graphic violence or this kid has a problem with swearing at inappropriate times. We don't want him exposed to foul language. We're trying to break him or her out of it. You know, it's parental choice. It's parental choice. So even that question, are you going to give this to a kid? I found offensive. Because the correct answer is, well, according to the ESRB, I can give to this kid. It's my kid. Parental rights matter. And that's, you know, that's that whole culture war thing that we're trying to legislate morality for people. And it's so crazy that we're having this fight over games and the nine-year-olds are going to gun ranges. Like, nine-year-olds are firing weapons in real life. But they can't play them in video games. Brr. And that's how silly the whole thing has become. And so I just, this is why I think that we have to come at this discussion from a perspective of inclusivity and sameness. Which means, guess what? One woman does not get to tell the entire gaming industry what all women think. One person of color. God, especially since there are so many unique experiences when it comes to race, right? I mean, a, a black person who was the, 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 you know, had ancestors who were slaves and somebody who came from Africa have radically different perspectives on life. And I know this because I know people from both traditions, right? Like watching them debate blackness is, is amazing. I sit there and say nothing or ask a couple questions and that's it. Cause I, I find it so, you know, you, you see the mosaic of the experience and one person can only say, this is, this is me. This is my opinion. This is what I responded to. And I think it's fair for somebody to say that they didn't feel a particular characterization was well handled or a particular device was not you know, employed effectively. That, that's totally fair. And, and, you know, you can say that about things you're more familiar with better than stuff you're not, right? Uh, you know, case in point, I know this guy, he finds Far Cry 3 to be complete cultural appropriation. And he doesn't like it. He doesn't like it's a white guy going in and solving everybody's problems. And, you know, I'm like, yeah, but the whole point is he's a douchebag, you know, and he's going in there is not solving any problem. He, and I, I don't want to spoil the game very much, but, you know, this, this guy who is, who is Middle Eastern, of Middle Eastern descent, he is adamant at his cultural appropriations. Like, who's right there? Well, neither of us are right. We have our perspectives. And, you know, it's like, okay, I, I don't agree but I'm, I don't agree, but I'm not going to say he's wrong, right? Because he's coming at that from a different perspective. He has different sensitivities, which unlike the internet fallacy of logic uber alles, um, people's sensitivities matter because these things are art. These are, are things about human characters or human-like characters. There's something with a character and a soul and a spirit in games. And so we can't be completely logical. Games have an intense artistic component to it. It's not logical. And so trying to talk about something that's inherently not logical, that's intending to be this, this sublime, um, you know, larger than life romantic experience in a lot of cases, we can't approach that completely from a position of logic that's, that's not giving it credit for being something that's supposed to touch us emotionally. Right? We can't do that. But again, people boil things down and distill them to the point where they're no longer helpful. And so what I want to do going forward is I want to work with people and I want to have conversations with people and I want to discuss, not debate. Because debate is for an audience. I want to have discussions. I want to have good conversations. 
And, you know, I want to be able to be interested in something when I'm talking to somebody and go, well, what do you mean by that? And, and you know, wh when you said this, can I get more information? And, you know, ask some questions without being accused of taking things over. Like, for fuck's sake, I was just curious, people. Stop being so paranoid. I'm not out to get anywhere. Most people in gaming are not out to get anybody. People may have very strong opinions. Fine, I have strong opinions. But that doesn't mean we're evil. We're out to get anybody. And, and uh, you know, we're not trying to ruin gaming or trying to ruin gaming. We just have our opinion. We have what we like. And we want to be able to say somewhere, this is what I liked or this is what I didn't like. And have that go, okay, your opinion's valid as your opinion. Instead of what hap is happening in comic books, which is what made me just check right the hell out of comic books, is... You know, they happen to be women, but I saw it happen to men too. People would come up and say, you know, I don't feel like your book is representing. There's no book in your company that speaks to me. And comic book editors are going, write your own comic. You shouldn't have to become a creator of something to consume things that speak to you. The whole idea is somebody coming up there and saying this doesn't speak to me is saying there's a, a hole in the marketplace to exploit. There is a demand for something that's not being supplied. So find somebody to make it. Instead of saying, write your own comic. No, I don't want people going, write your own video game. I want to stop video games from getting from that stupid, arrogant, you know, smug, write your own comic. Why do you think people don't read comics as much as they, oh, okay, sales are up. No, sales... They go up and they go down and they go up and they go down and they always go back to their natural resting place, which is not enough to care about. It's not like when things sold millions and millions of copies during the speculation of the 90s. Comics are way low. Why? Because people who want to see superheroes go to movies, right? And there's plenty of people reading comics. And the reason women in comics is such a big thing is they're new readers. They're a growth potential. And that's why they're being catered to. And I think that's great. But personally, I was put off from the, from comics with the write your own comics thing. And that's the big two. I do read independent comics and I read graphic novels and there's still certain uh, artists and writers I follow. And, you know, they're friends, so I read their stuff. Uh, but it takes me a while to catch up. I wait for the trade paperbacks and I have to be in the mood because when I read a comic now, I just get write your own comic when I'm like, oh, I didn't really like this story or something like that. I don't want that to happen to games. I don't. And so that's where I want to go. So if you want to have a conversation from that place, awesome. But it has to be about games. It can't be about the drama surrounding games. Because in my opinion, and I'm stating this right now, Every gamer has more in common with every other gamer than we have differences. And that's the position we should come into every conversation. Because what do we have in common? We're passionate about games. Which immediately gives us more in common than us and somebody who, say, likes monster trucks. Right? So that's the zen for the day. And this, this isn't Pollyanna. This isn't being, like, you know... Oh, let's all be kind to each other and sing Kumbaya and hug. No, this is just, this is, this is logic, okay? And it's lo not logic divorced from emotion. Because people who don't have an emotional connection to other people make bad decisions. Our, our empathy informs good choices. So this is, you know, the cross-section of empathy and logic, which is where we get our best ideas from, right? So that's the Zen for today. More the same than different. We're going to look at the mountain and we're going to breathe. Breathe in. And out. And breathe in. And out.